brothers and sisters because uh, their focus in reality was to save the most people they could so they could be ready for uh, Christ's second coming. They didn't have no other uh, motive besides this one. And he basically quotes, uh, Bliss quotes him in page 328. My whole object was a desire to convert souls to God, to notify the world of a coming judgment, and to induce my fellow men to, um, to make that preparation of heart, which will enable them to meet their God in peace. And this is found in Great Controversy 375.2. So just like Noah received a message concerning uh, his present time, and it was a message of warning of uh, things that were about to happen. He believed by faith this message, and he prepared his house and also, you know, the ark with fear. It says the Bible says with fear, and he preached for these 120 years in the in the same way. Um, William Miller and his associates they also received this message from God. They believed it was coming. They were convicted of it, and they did their best to warn the people of what was about to happen. Um, and I believe this is a spirit that should, you know, motivate each one of us, right? A spirit of, um, of, of worry of, of you know, um, responsibility for the light that we have. And what happens when that light that we receive is not heated? Well, that's the whole topic of this, uh, the whole, um, the main part of this uh, chapter, and that's what we're going to see. What happens to a nation when they um, they don't heed the message that God has given for their time? What happens to a church when they don't heed the message that applicable to our life, and we don't heed that message? What is the result of of not heeding the message? And we're going to see the results, and also we're going to see. Um, what are the results of heeding that message and uh, the blessings that can bring to others, right? So uh, during that time, uh, the first part of that of the, those years, the message at first was received with with uh, with a lot of like uh, joy, and it was very people were very receptive. As well, also pastors were very receptive, but as time went by and people saw the seriousness of this message. Um, it started with the leaders of the churches. They started to reject this message, if not just um, just out there, just just preaching it. They would oppose people from even talking about the subject. Not even that. They um, they you could say they threatened members in church that they would be kicked out if they kept preaching or talking about this message. So this brought a controversy between the members of these churches. And their leaders, um, and I don't know, Damien, if you saw what the controversy was. It says it right there. Um, basically, it, it was it was an awful time for them. What what happened to these to these uh, to these members that were part of this church of these churches? Well, I, I don't know. I think at the the very end, like it says in the summer of eighteen forty four, about fifty thousand withdrew from the churches. That is a lot. So I was like, that's crazy. Just to think that that many people. But the thing is, like, they were faced with a, um, you know, complexity, something, it was a great challenge for them, you know, it was something that, you know, that tried them, it was, you know, it was a test, it was a test of their, of their character, you know. That's right. So they had to choose between being loyal to the church, which they had, they loved, and they, they um, actually, they enjoyed the company of their brothers and sisters, even the pastors, but they had to choose between that. Or the truth oh, God. that God had, yeah, that's right. The truth that God had given them, and for many of these people, the truth was more precious. It was more precious to them than whatever this world could give. So they um, they decided to leave these churches. Um, but around this time, the same time, there was uh, something was happening with the spirituality of the churches in that time. And you could say that spirituality um, in the Protestant churches wasn't very well. Uh, the health of the churches was, was um, you could say, was, was in ICU status, right? Um, yeah. the, the church was basically going to almost needed CPR, you know? Um, and, and the churches, even the, the worldlings were noting 
that spirituality in the United States in that time was in a big crisis, right? Um, and there's a there's a quote I have right here. I don't know if you can read this, uh, Damien, right there. Um, that Professor uh, Finney of Oberlin College said. Yeah, I'll go ahead and read it. It says, um, in the month of February of the same year, Professor uh, Finney of Oberlin College uh, said very extensively, church members are becoming uh, devotees of fashion, join hands with uh, the ungodly in parties of pleasure, in dancing, in festivities, etc. But we need not expand on this painful subject. Suffice it, suffice it that the evidence uh, thickens and thick, sorry, thickens and rolls heavily, heavily upon us uh, to show that the churches uh, generally are becoming sadly degener uh, degenerate. They have gone very far from the Lord, and they are uh, and He has withdrawn Himself from them. Also, had that part highlighted on one. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so we're even thinking: Has the grace of God departed from us? You know, I think there's a part where that it, it, the, a writer was saying that um, they they were seeing it was very palpable the yeah. um, the apostasy that was going on, or the coldness, the spiritual coldness that was. I was being experienced in the churches. There was no, hardly any converts during that time. I think uh, the churches didn't baptize many people. Um, there were also, uh, there was a time when uh, I guess there's financial blessings on the land. So uh, industrially and socially and economically, the, the country was going through a very well phase. Yeah, but there was a need, there was a uh -huh. I was just going to say, it says, there's, a, there's a quote before the one we just read. It says, with the increase of business and the brightening prospects of commerce and manufacture, there was an increase in world, uh, worldly mind mindedness. So pretty much, and this was in all denominations, like with the increase of all this business, like people started to turn to themselves, you know, instead of you know, focusing on the truth or God. That's true. So they became more materialistic, right? They started right. putting their focus on the things of this world. Um, the question is, where did it all start? Why did this happen? You know, why, why the sudden degeneracy in religion and spirituality? And uh, Sister White uh, points the finger at something right here in, in Great Controversy 377.3. Mario, can you read this uh, part, please? Uh, sure. 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 I've been a lot of echo on your side. Okay. Um, let's see. I wonder why that thing is doing that. Oh, hold on. I know. So it says, can you guys hear me? All right, I'll read it. Um, it says, such a condition never exists without a cause in the church itself. It says, the spiritual darkness which falls upon nations, upon churches, and individuals. And it says right here is due to an arbitrary, it's not due, sorry, to an arbitrary withdrawal of the, of the succors of divine grace on the part of God, but to neglect or rejection of divine light on the part of men. So in reality, the fall of why, uh, of the, why the, or the reason for the spiritual um, fall was because light had been neglected, right? I had been, um, had, hadn't been heated. So that's what Sister White says right there, page 377.3. Uh, and this takes me to, and I see that history repeats itself, and through all these lessons, we've seen this lesson um, manifested that um, God gives us lessons that He wishes to, for us to apply to our time. And these lessons are, are found in the past, right? And one of these lessons is found in just in the story of the Jewish nation. What do you guys think about what, what happened with the Jewish nation and the light that God had given them? And what were the consequences of that? I don't know if comment about that. The chapter continues saying, I don't know what, what you think about this, Jacob, if you're still there. Um, Peter or Damien. I was, was going to say about um, Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, like, I see the, the relationship between the Jewish people and kind of like Pharaoh. Uh, I wrote it on, you know, because like, they, they're like, 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 they're
And Mario, I think you're a little too close to Damien. Yeah, I just a man off. Okay. Uh, and I was just saying, there's a lot of like, you know, correlation between both of them, like in the fact that they have forgotten God completely, and you know, they would go back and forth to the point where they couldn't distinguish evil from right. Okay, so that's like that's a good. Very, that's a very somber truth right there, right? Um, I don't know what anyone else wants to comment about this section. What what happened to a Jew? The story of the of the Protestant church is in the years in the early uh, 19th century. Uh, how do we see this um, depicted there and how are we seeing it today too? So if um, I think when it, when it was referring to the, I guess the early, like the, the Jewish nation, um, LNG White kind of mentions that they rejected the prophecy from Daniel, the 90 day prophecy of, Jesus, of the Messiah returning at that time. Yes, so. Perfect. So it was not a really good thing. So through the prophecy of Daniel, the Jewish nation had been given a most splendid light. Um, they had even had, they could calculate the exact time of Christ's first, uh, first advent, right? But it happened that the Jewish leaders to a time, to even to an extent, they even prohibited people to calculate this prophetic time period. They, um, they didn't want to talk about it. They just, you know, ignored it. They didn't um, promote the study of the, of the prophecy. And um, they stuck very staunchly to their traditions, right? And what happened to them is that they tobogganed into this uh, crazy national apostasy and to deep spiritual darkness that by the time that Jesus came, the, their minds were already set, they were already hardened so much that the most outstanding evidences that Jesus was the Son of God were just being ignored or were being um, rejected, right? So they saw Jesus Christ, you know, uh, crucified. Um, they, they didn't stop, you know, they didn't stop in their rejection of the truth. And they went even further than that. They went and killed Stephen afterwards, right? Uh, a few years after that. So, yes, in the Jewish nation, we see this. And in page 377.3, uh, we see this first quote. It says, by their devotion to the world and forgetfulness of God and his word, their understanding had become darkened, their hearts earthly and sensual. And we're going to talk a little bit more in, 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 uh, in uh, further on about how this earthly and sensual state of mind prohibits us to understand the truth for our time. It happened in Noah's time, it happened here in the Jewish nation, it happened in 1844, and it is certainly happening in these last days. And this last other quote in the bottom we see here, it says, it suits the policy of Satan. This is powerful, listen to this. It suits the policy of Satan that men should retain the forms of religion if but the spirit of vital godliness is lacking. That's uh, Great Controversy 378.1. And so, uh, I was. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I was going to mention that <clears throat> when I read that part, when it says it suits the policy of Satan that men should retain the form of God of religion, um, my mind went back to to Second Timothy chapter three, you know, and where he mentions that in the last days we're gonna have the, oh, people that are boasting and disobedient children, uh, blasphemers, and despisers of them that are good, lovers of pleasure, the lovers of God, and at the end it says those people, they have a form of godliness, or you could say a form of religion, meaning they're professing uh, Jesus Christ. They call themselves Christians, but yet they are taking God's name in vain because they are living opposite or contrary to what God's law uh, asked them to do. And the godliness part, they are lacking it, and there, if you have a Jesus Christ label on, or if you're uh, in a denomination, 
as long as you are not living according to God's uh, principles, that for him is enough. You know, we're seeing the rise of, um, and we're going to see very soon a false revival. Remember, this is another subject, another topic. But we're going to see that with the true revival in these last days, when God's um, well, latter rain starts to be poured down on his people, Satan is going to bring about a uh, false revival. So there's going to be a big interest in Christian principles and Christianity by itself, you know. But there's going to be a lot of this, you know. There's going to be a lot of uh, just the formal, you know, the, the outward um, manifestation of Christianity, but the vital godliness, you know, this uh, new form of Christianity uh, rise up, and I think we're seeing it rise up already. So I, I, I'm not going to read off, but well, maybe this, this is pretty powerful. It says, uh, Damien, can you read this uh, first part over here? I don't know who else is active on your part. I see you, Damien. Oh, I see Peter now. OK, yeah. Uh, I'll do that for two, two. OK. Uh, wherever the cause exists, the same result, uh, results will follow. He who deliberately stifles his convictions of duty because it interferes with his inclinations will finally lose the power to, dist to distinguish between truth and error. Uh, that's that's the I don't know. That's the part like kind of like how we were talking about earlier, like with the Jewish people. You know, like they were going so back and forth so many times that they eventually mix things up. They were lukewarm. You know, they, they mix good with bad. Much. Yeah, man, it's powerful. I mean, it's dangerous to stifle any conviction God gives you when you read the word just because it doesn't suit you. You know, it just interferes with your pleasures and your and your way of thinking, even, right? Yeah. I, sure. I don't know if you, can you continue that? Yeah, I was going to I was going to finish the rest. It says uh, the understanding becomes darkened, uh, the conscious uh, callous, the heart hardened and the soul uh, is separated from God. Where the message of divine truth is uh, spurned or slighted, uh, there the church will be enshrouded in darkness. That's powerful. So we see here almost like steps of what happens, how we our mind becomes um, darkened, right? Just by stifling conviction, little by little, you know. And this doesn't happen one day to the next. It happens, you know, maybe through years. You know, you've known this life for many years. And many, many times we probably haven't given our whole life, you know, 100% to the conviction, you know, um, and to obedience to the truth as we have it. And what happens is that even imperceptibly, our conscience starts becoming callous, um, hardened, you know. And once we are separated from God and we don't heed this message, this message just becomes just any other message, I guess. Um, then we, we are enshrouded in darkness that, you know, maybe it's impossible for us to come out of. So are we seeing this these days? Um, and more importantly, can this be happening in my life today? Can this be happening? Am I, have I received a message, whether it be in health reform, whether it be in um, personal sins, you know, whether it be, I don't know, any other truth that we've had, the Sabbath, whatever, anything that, God is calling us to leave or to do, and we haven't given our 100% to God. I think this is a message for us to heed the warning, to humble ourselves before the Lord, and and God will come and, and enlighten our souls. So does anyone have any comments on this? I see you there, Jacob, now. I don't know if you have any comments on this part. Um, yeah, it's just me and Yesi were talking um, Last night in our own worship, we're both reading um, uh, the devotional Our High Calling. And uh, this past week, she's been talking a lot about um, gaining um, the victory, if you will, or having control uh, and mastering your thoughts and, you know, what you're thinking about during the day and not having, you know, we realize temptations can come in, but not dwelling on those. Instead, turning our minds to heavenly things, not Christian things. And it's something um, we both have just felt impressed even before we were reading that. Like, you know, this is something we need to be, 
need to be doing. And then, you know, we kind of had that, that was kind of the devotion that was coming through the week. So that was really powerful as something um, personally for us that we're, you know, that we are working on. I think that, um, you know, through this, you know, this whole crisis, and I know we've kind of probably talked about this before, but God is, is very gracious in how he's uh, continues to send warning signs to give us a chance to wake up. Um, you know, he could just finish the judgment and cut it off, but he he's, keeps trying to send warning signs and, and things to wake his people up. He's in the He's in the business of wanting to save us and give us every chance we can to be saved rather than, you know, being someone strict to just cut things off. So I think that um, it is it is really important to to hear those warnings and feel the Holy Spirit working on your heart and then uh, be willing to to give it up. It's I mean, we all know whatever it is for us individually, it's, it's tough sometimes. Hmm. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Jacob. Um, it all starts with the with the thoughts, right? And so, God is calling us to control those thoughts. Um, it's a saying in, it goes in Spanish: you can't um, avoid the, the the birds standing on your head or something like that, but you can avoid them making a nest on on top of your head or something like that. You know, you, you can't avoid certain thoughts. You know, sometimes come in and come out. You know, but you can't avoid them. You know, caressing them and you know feeding them. You know. Because then that becomes a sin, and that brings darkness to our lives. So, um, in His mercy, God saw the condition of the church, and in His mercy, He sent a message to the church to awaken the church. And we see this message; we've all, you know, reviewed it several times. And it's the first angel's message. And I don't know, you know, how many of you remember what it what is implied in the first angel's message? But as you know, I guess this will be as a review. Um, the message basically says judgment has begun. So this is no ordinary time, right? This is that that this is what William Miller and his associates were preaching. They were saying this is no ordinary time. Judgment has begun, and the faces of each one of us will begin to be um, examined, right? Especially by the Seventh Day Adventist Church when they when it started to 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 grow. This is the message that they had. Um, they also preach fear God, which means, you know, shun sin from your life, obedience to the law of God, fear God, for this is the beginning of wisdom. Give him glory, house people, so that they could see their true condition of worldliness and backsliding. It was supposed to open and, you know, uh, awaken them to their true condition, right? And it was going to, the purpose also was to separate them from the world and to prepare them to stand in the presence of Jesus Christ. Um, many have the idea, the crazy idea these days, I don't know where that we get it, but we have this crazy idea that we can just, you know, and I think it, it comes up, it surges from a lack of understanding of who God is, I think. Um, but there's people that believe in Christianity that we can just go up and, you know, present ourselves before God just as we are. And we'll be fine, you know, like if he was just my homie, my 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 compadre, you know, my friend, you know, like we treat God like as one of us, you know what I mean? And um, we don't understand that to be before the presence of God, you must be holy, right? You must be holy because his, his presence will totally and utterly destroy you if you have sin in your life. I don't know if uh, Damien, you want to talk about, uh, want to say something about this, want to comment something. Yeah, yeah. I had, but I just think like the Revelation. What was it? Verse, um, chapter eighteen, verse four. I know it, it explains it to the end, but that's why that that's why that warning is there, and it says, "Come out of her, my people, lest you sh uh, share in her sins." And uh, book is saying like you know Babylon is derived from Babel, which signifies confusion. You know, yeah. And you know we're we're living in a time where so many people are confused. You know, and. Really, the only thing that you know you can you can do is, is read the Bible, you know, to to you know truly distinguish right from wrong. And That's I think, true. I mean, yeah, yeah. And the, and this message, the first angel's message, was there was was sent just to wake up people. I said, like, just give them a cold shower, you know, just to awaken them to see their um their uh 
that they were destitute, right? But as we saw, this message only aroused their prejudice and unbelief. And if, if, uh, Jacob, can you read this uh, this paragraph on the bottom? I think it's very important, this, this second paragraph. The fact that the message was to a great extent preached by laymen was ur urged as an argument against it. As of old, the plain testimony of God's word was met with the inquiry, have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed? I don't know. I don't know what you guys think about this part, but it, I think it's powerful. You know, we're living in a time where we sort of celebrate, you know, people that have doctorates, kids, and I'm not saying anything. There's nothing wrong about that. But um, to an extent, if you're just a regular layman, it, it seems like you don't have much to say in regards to theology. Right. But it's very interesting to see that it was fishermen in the time of Jesus that preached the word with power, you know, and conviction. So much that the Pharisees, when they brought them to, you know, Peter and John to the uh, Sanhedrin, they were they were just amazed. They were just like baffled. How can these fishermen speak with such authority, right? Um, and it wasn't that God didn't want to use the the high ones of the earth, the educated ones, but it was because their pride you know, um, didn't allow God to work through them, you know? So, do you guys think God can use the same methods these days? And do you think, do you guys believe this, this could happen again? What do you guys think? What do you think, Damien? Sure. Uh, no, that's true. Uh-huh. No, that's true. I think it could happen. And um, I think uh, I wanted to share this thing right here, which says, uh, I don't know exactly where it's found. Cause I, I mean, everybody has a different book, but uh, it says uh, rather be content with honor that comes from God. Because during that time, like you were saying earlier, like, you know, like all these people, like, uh, they, they wanted to glorify themselves, you know, or they wanted to, you know, do things out of their own will, you know. Uh, and it continues and it says, a profession of religion has become popular with the world. Rulers, politicians, lawyers, doctors, merchants join the church as a means of securing the respect and confidence of society and advancing their own worldly interests. So instead of doing it for yourself, you know, and for you to truly seek you know god's will you know to truly seek you know that uh, acceptance of god you know like you're, you're doing it for you know so that other people would glorify you and i think that's a very dangerous place to be and i wanted to share um galatians 2 verse 20 uh, and 21 which i think you know most of us know but i'll go ahead and read it it says uh i have been crucified to the uh, sorry i have been crucified with christ it is no longer i who live but christ uh, lives in me uh, and the life which I now uh, live in flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. I do not set us. Uh, I do not set aside the grace of God. For uh, if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And our, uh, you know, accomplishments, you know, aside, and to truly focus on what God is, God is doing for us. Yeah, that's right. Um, and to be ready to leave, uh, to be humble, and to be um, just. A, a tool in the in the in the hands of the Lord, you know, that is willing to be used by Him, whether, however He wants to use us. Um, uh, these times, you know, we have a lot of truck drivers here, but I see I see I see this like you know, I'll esteem very much, you know, because of their knowledge. Um, but it, it's very interesting that when God uses humble people to speak, whether whatever their profession might be, the truth, the glory of the truth. It just shines in a marvelous way, you know what I mean? It's just, it just, it's just, it's very beautiful how it's presented. The people today, right. uh -huh. I was gonna say another thing, and also like not just that, but uh, William Miller himself says, you know, that he, he labored uh, among all parties and sects. So it doesn't, it didn't mean that you know he wasn't like he didn't show partiality towards you know one community versus another, you know. Uh, you know, he, he pretty much did the Great Commission, you know, in March, uh, in Matthew 28. You know, he preached to everybody, you know, regardless of, of color or where they came from. That's true. Or, you know, how they were, how they acted, you know, how much money they earned and so forth. So I think it's important also for us That's to, true. to learn that. I was going to mention that it is interesting that sometimes when we look at what happened in the time of the, the Jews, and even in that time of William Miller, where the, the people that were bringing the message were laymen, 
uh, I think one day I was uh, having a Bible study with a friend and one of the person from, from the school, I'm not going to mention what school it is. Now, I'm, I'm sure you guys know already what school I'm talking about here in Kin. Um, the person was walking, I think he works in the administration office and he saw me uh, with, a, with my computer and everything. And I, as I was talking to the to my friend on, a, we were, I think we were doing a Zoom or Skype meeting. At the end, I was, after I was done, I saw him again and he approached me and said, I saw you were doing a Bible study. I said, yes, I was doing a Bible study. And he said, um, are, you a, are you a theology major or a theology student or your pastor? And I was thinking, why would you think why would you first assume that I would be a pastor or a theology major? And when I said no, and he, he kind of was surprised because apparently to him, uh, most likely it's people that study theology that are more likely interested in doing Bible study. Whereas where I'm from, you're going to find most people that do the Bible studies are not pastors. They're most likely people that do other things for a living. And so even today, we still have that same, uh, I would say, kind of stereotype type of things going on. Sorry, cut up. I don't, I don't know if he's speaking. No, I just finished what I was saying. Did you hear that? Okay. Yeah, well, you know, I thought you were a pastor too, man. I mean, so you got me too. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, for your, your input, um, the people in that time, um, largely the churches and in, in the, the Protestant, uh, Protestant churches, they rejected the message, the first angel's message. So God sent another message, and it's called the second angel's message, right? You guys know this message. And just like Damien was saying, it, it, it talks about Babylon, right? And we talked about what Babylon is. Uh, uh, Damien already mentioned a little bit about this. But it comes from Babel, right? And in Babel, you see this, the beginnings of this effort for Satan to create this one world religion, right? Or this one world, world power in defiance to the authority of God. And, um, and there's just people from all over, you know, the world. And there's just lifting up of... Uh, a fist, a one world fist, you could say to God, you know, and saying, you know what, we defy you and we defy your judgments, you know. So in response, it's very interesting. In response to the first angel's message, here comes the second angel's message. And in response to the flood, here comes the Tower of Babel. You see this? So in response to the judgments of God, here comes the people and they defy God. They defy his judgments. We defy you, God. You know, who are you to destroy us? And they lift up this tower and they say, you know what? We can we can deal with you and your judgments. We don't care about you. What they're saying in reality is we don't care about your law. We don't care about what you have to say about our lives, you know? You, who are you to judge us, you know? Have we heard this before? Mm -hmm. um, and um, and basically, as you know, those that, those of us that have read history, we know that here uh, the establishment of the sun worship is 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 begun. I don't know if, uh, if any of you uh, remember this. I, I honestly believe that its roots were even before the flood. But here, in a in a great in a grand scale, the the, the worship of the sun is really established. And here is where a lot of other religions derive from. And 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 that's why uh, we have also the name Babel. That means confusion, right? confusion mm -hmm. and and basically babylon is the symbol of use in scriptures of every false religion uh mixing with worldliness and with the political power of the kings of the earth right? so we have we have a, a a verse here in jeremiah 320 i don't know about peter can you read this please surely as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord Jeremiah three twenty. How uh, can you read the next one? One, you're there now. Sure. But thou didst trust in thine own beauty, and playest the harlot because of thine renown, and pourest out the fornications on every one that passed by, 
is it was Ezekiel 16. So before God, we are considered to be like a wife, right? His church is a wife. And he sees us as his wife. And when we depart from him, he sees us as a, it's, it sounds tough. And it's, it's a big pill to swallow, but he, he basically treats, he describes us as a harlot, right? Um, and in Bible prophecy, we know this already too, that the second angel's message talking about Babylon and confusion um, in Revelation 17, we see that it depicts it as a woman, right? Um, a pure woman is, you know, dressed in white, standing on the moon. And this harlot has filed itself is seen as this uh, harlot, which is, has different characteristics. And we're going to see them very quickly right here. Uh, first of all, it's arrayed in purple and scarlet, decked with gold and precious stones, has a golden cup in her hand, and it's full of abominations. Take in mind that we're talking about churches here, right? Um, in its forehead, it has a name. It says Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. So if it's the mother, it obviously has other little harlots, you can say, right? <laughs> so, and these harlots, as described by Great Controversy, page 382 and 383, it says these little harlots, it's the churches that cling to her doctrines and traditions, talking about the Roman Catholic Church. So the main, the mother of all these uh, prostitutes, in reality, as depicted by the Word of God and seen throughout history and the studies that we've done before, it's basically the, the Roman Catholic Church and the churches that derive from it that still cling to the doctrines, to its doctrines and traditions. So what doctrines and traditions have Protestant churches clung to? that make them harlots. You Mainly it's, um, it's the, the false worship system. And uh, yes, oh, I would say if I don't be plain about it, then it would be uh, when they're keeping the day of the sun, which we now call Sunday. And that, uh, yes, it's uh, the, the spirit will be, it's put out as called the spurious Sabbath because it is not the true one. And uh, traditions as well that the Eucharist, that they actually do, some of them do. Uh, and basically disregarding the word of God, uh, baptism and all the things like that. As well, I guess... Yeah. Um, with I guess uh, Mary and all that, mm. with the re there. veneration of the saints. That's right. Yeah. What What do you guys say about the state of the dead? Right. Um, so forgiveness of sins too. The forgiveness of sin, purgatory. Um, you can see uh, you see a lot of stuff, right? So a lot of, ch of these churches that have derived from this uh, main church. They've, they've clung to these uh, traditions and you see thousands upon thousands of Christian churches and you could say someone that comes from the world and wants to join a Christian church, they could just Google and they have a myriad of just bunch of churches and they all believe certain things. And what does this create? Confusion. This creates confusion, exactly, man. It creates confusion because you know, some accept certain parts of the truth, but some other ones, you know, cling to these false traditions and doctrines. So we see this big confusion and Satan wants it this way. Um, and, and, and that's what's going on. And, and it continues saying right there, they sacrifice truth in order to form an unlawful allegiance with the world. So that's basically what's happening right there. They are also, what's that? That's right. Say, yeah, one foot in, one foot out. Yeah. Yeah. It, it says they're also drunk with the blood of the saints and martyrs. And you guys could say, well, the Protestant churches haven't done this. But, you know, it's just like the Pharisees that would, you know, build the, the, the what could, what's called the, the tombs of the, of the prophets. And Jesus would say, yeah, you build up the tombs of the prophets, but you still have the same spirit of those of your fathers that killed those prophets. So when they cling to these doctrines and traditions so blindly, and they still have the love of the world, talking about the Protestant churches, they are really being 
part of this uh, of the system which killed so many saints and martyrs. And Sister White actually later describes how the persecutions by the Protestant churches will be um, will be magnified, you know, in comparison to what the Roman Catholic Church did in the Dark Ages. And finally, it says they have an unlawful relations with, with relation with the kings of the earth. So this is this union of church and state. I was going to mention something very quickly. Quickly, um, when when you go, if you go back to the to the to the slide before that, uh, the first thing that caught my attention was when it says that arrayed in purple and scarlet, decked with gold and precious stones. Uh, my mind went back to Exodus 28, talking about the, the breastplate of the priesthood. It had the, the effort, and the breastplate had the, the precious stones, the 12 precious stones. And funny thing is this, this uh, supposed uh, church that has purple and scarlet, but it's missing the color blue, which means that this church had forgotten God's commandment because blue, God says, you will put a blue in your, in your fringe of your clothes to remember my commandments. And here we have this church with purple and scarlet, but yet there is no blue showing up, which means yeah, that church had forgotten God's commandment. Um, that's true. Uh, the one that is missing is the blue, which represents the law of God. Um, but they have made the material world their God, right? Mm -hmm. So Dr. Hopkins, in a treatise of uh, or a treatise of on the millennium, declares there is no reason to consider the anti spirit and practice is to be confined to what to that which is now called the Church of Rome. The Protestant churches have much of Antichrist in them, are far and are far from being wholly reformed. Corruptions, they have, they're full of corruptions and wickedness. This is Samuel Hopkins works, volume two, page 328. So even people from, you know, the secular world would see that the Protestant churches were following on the heels of the Catholic church, right? Um, and the question was, what was the origin of this great apostasy? How did the church first depart from the simplicity of the gospel? And I, I think we saw this in the past in the first chapters of the great controversy. Um, and if you guys remember, basically the church began as very, very humble, simple, pure. Um, you guys remember what the first church of the, the seven churches in the Revelation are? What's the first church? Ephesus. Ephesus. Um, and it says right here that during their lives, the church remained pure. But what happened was that when the, the second century came about and the first uh, fathers, you know, died, they went to the, to the graves, the new converts or their children came up and they started, they came forward and they new modeled the cause. It says right there, I don't know if you see it right there, highlight, highlighted. It says Robert Robinson, Ecclesiastes, Researchers. Um, and that's very interesting, that word that he uses there, the new model, the cause. And, and basically what it means is that to secure converts, the exalted standard of the Christian faith was lowered. And as a result, a pagan flood flowing into the church with it, its customs, practices, and idols. So basically, we, we, are, we could see this even today, right? As the... Are our fathers that have believed in the third angel's messages and what you know the first fathers believed and everything, the new generations come and they say, you know what, this is not working. This is not bringing anyone to the church. You know, we have to be more appetizing to the world, right? But to make the mistake of lowering the standard and trying to look more like the world to attract the world. And I don't know what the, what the consequence, what do you guys think about the consequences, Damien? What do you think about this? Uh, I mean, it's not, it's not a good thing to do. I mean, I don't know. Uh, but like you said earlier, like we were talking about earlier, like they're, they're confused. And I think it's something that's carried on through generations. And it's, 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 a, it's a dangerous thing, you know, to, um, 
to think that you can mix other things, you know, with, uh, you know, with the truth, the word of God. That's right. Well, what happens as a result is a degeneracy of spirituality and darkness starts to creep in. And later on, you cannot foretell the signs of the times that that's what's what that's what happens. So, um, here, let me see. Uh, we have this, we have the condition of the, of the, of the here also led, uh, said by a secular journal. And it said, insensibly, the church has yielded to the spirit of the age and adapted its forms of worship to modern wants. So, and basically, great controversy right there in page 286. It, it talks about, it describes what was happening with the Christian churches and how they were conforming themselves to this world. And I don't know if you guys see this. They had costly and fa fashionable attire. Uh, they paid a high salary to talented ministers to entertain and attract the people. Uh, the sermons had to, they cannot touch popular sins. They were supposed to be made, be made smooth, pleasing for fashionable years. And the result was that fashionable sinners were enrolled on the church records and fashionable sins were concealed on their pretense of godliness. Yeah. Wow. I mean, if you could describe our world, our Christian world today, this paragraph for real, I, I don't know what you guys think about yeah. this, but I, I, I agree. I, I think this paragraph was the one that struck out the most. And I think it's like, it's not, it's not to, you know, not like not to look at the pastors, you know, our, our leaders per se in the church, but to look at ourselves as well. You know, I think it applies to everybody because, um, you know, like you, you, we have to be careful, like, you know, to think like, Oh, I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings because I want the numbers in the church to grow, you know? But it's just like, it's something that the people need to hear. It's something that we all need to hear, you know, like sometimes truth hurts, but it's something that must be preached, you know? That, that's true. Um, and like John the Baptist, you know, he, he was not very popular, but when he preached the, the truth and he preached and he called sin by its name, you know, he, he was found to be uh, faithful in the books of heaven when the kings of the earth were, you know, chopping off his head, right? So we shouldn't worry about what popularity or what this world's culture says. We should be more preoccupied like William Miller and his associates to warn the people because true love does that, right? True love is not going to smooth out things when we know that there isn't peace. You know, a lot of people want to say peace, peace when there is no peace in the world, right? There are, we're living in a time where uh, souls are endangered for eternity, right? And we must give the warning. Um, and I don't know what you guys think about this. We're about to start heading, start landing for, for a conclusion. But it says right here, I, I found this little quote right here. I don't know, Peter, if you can read this, the one in 387.2. Says, if funds are wanted now, nobody must be called on to give. Oh no, have a fair, uh, tableau, mock trial, antiquarian supper, or something to eat, anything to amuse the people. I, I, I don't know what you think about this, but I thought it was very interesting because we, in, even in our, in our churches, I see in my church, you know, and I've been part of, of, of even, uh, um, I don't know, organize stuff that we learn when we money. We just give out food, you know, we just provide food to attract people. Um you hear me? You guys hear me well? Not so well. Peter, you hear me well? I think it's breaking. Yeah. So I was saying that sometimes even in organizing a fair or um, or even you know the fair of, of, of nations or the culture one, we have the food very funny, you know. And it seems he left the meeting. Uh, did he? <laughs> I think this uh, the signal was probably bad. Yeah. But I think I think it's um I think it is actually very interesting that this actually happens because uh, I never understood why 
whenever there is a Bible study, then there has to be food. I even till now I'm still wondering why do we have to have food for a Bible study? And and I learned throughout the years I've been here, I learned that from people that have been here longer than me, they have told me, Mario, if you don't have food, then people are not gonna come. And my response was to them is that if they're gonna come because there is food, then they're not really interested in Bible study. And if you were to give the Bible the, the food before Bible study, many would have left. But if you're gonna give it after, then of course they're gonna stay because they wanna have part with the food. So that was kind of funny that happens sometimes. And what what you guys wanna say? The, the Bible on the Bible only, you know, like it should be something that, you know, that, that should suffice. That, that should be enough, you know, for, for us to be truly convinced that that's, that's, you know, that's enough what we need. You know, like we don't need all these other things, you know, to, to attract us to the word of God. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think um, Ellen White says, you know, sometimes we go trying to pick the fruit that is not right. Mm -hmm. Um and sometimes when we do, you know, all that stuff, we're trying to attract the wrong kind of people. And we, um, not the wrong kind of people, but the people who aren't right, uh, say it that way. Um, you know, we need to, when we're putting out the right, um, the pure things, and what we should be putting out, then we're going to get the, the people who are, who are ripe and ready to, ready to accept it. And sometimes it's hard for us know we whether you know someone or maybe you're doing a bible study you're like man i think this person is ready but you know maybe they are maybe they aren't mm -hmm. and um this is kind of a good way to know for sure um I see. I see the evil of in the in this last the next part in, in this worldliness and pleasure seeking self denial right there and self sacrifice. That's the other one. For Christ's sake, we're almost fully really lost. And 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 my, if I see this in in our time now, we can't ask for any funds or for any money. Did you get cut off again? Yeah. 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 I think something is wrong with his um, internet connection. Uh, there you go. I have to. I can't really hear you. <laughs> you guys hear me? Can you hear me now? Now we can. A little bit, yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I don't know what's going on. That I have good signal and everything, but it's it's all of us. Is it? Maybe, maybe it's God telling us um, we've done too long. Bible studies are just True. I stopped the Facebook live, so you guys can continue. Okay. That's fine. Don't worry. Was say it was something along with uh, was talking about uh, how Rome relates to today. I'm gonna share a quote. I don't know exactly where it's from because it's reading off of a different book, very controversy book. But uh, it says a man uh, cannot become a preacher at all anywhere without accepting some book besides the Bible. Uh, there is nothing. And it's crazy how this is in Ellen White's book. You know, 
because it's like you know a lot of people think like you know oh people who read Ellen White or you know it's on, they're only reading Ellen White but it's not true because even, he, even even herself she says that the Bible and the Bible alone is enough you know uh, and then it continues it says there is nothing imaginary in the statement that uh, the creed that the creed power is now beginning to prohibit the Bible as uh, as really as Rome did though in a subtler way and it's true like in a way like. You know, and it's it's crazy to say that, you know, in some churches, it's like what's being preached is not like present truth. You know, it's not uh, it's, it's not as important. You know, it's it's not I'm not saying that it's not important what they preach. I'm just saying, like, it's, you know, we're close to these last days and it's something that needs to be preached. You know, and in a way, the, the Bible is being uh, hindered a little bit. You know, if you guys understand what I'm saying, in a way, it's, it's being hindered. And it's something that, you know, it's that's supposed to be preached out, you know, like and that's uh, that's our calling, you know. Especially as Adventists. Mm. All right. Um, uh, if you guys can hear me. A little bit. Yeah, it's still. Can you guys hear me? Can you yeah. say something one more time? That's uh. I'm going to move. Do that. Is it working now? Is it working now? We now better. I can't hear. Oh. Uh, Why the internet connection? Um, so, uh, try try doing it without the screen sharing. I don't know. Maybe that'll help. I'm not sure. <laughs> Can you hear me? Say that again. Can you hear me? Can't hear you. I guess we got his point though, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, was there anything else that you guys wanted to share or anything to to close off? Uh, I I was actually going to go way back to when we were talking about what happened with the Jews and that and that we uh what it means for us. I don't know if you guys can hear me perfectly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I was I was thinking of it as as we were talking about the the situation with when, when we when we slight uh, God's warning and what happens to us. And I remember in the book of Acts in chapter uh, 7, as we mentioned, uh, the 70 weeks prophecy, uh, when 
Stephen was talking to the Jews or just to the Pharisees, uh, to the leaders, and he decided to give them the history of the whole nation from the time that he started with Moses, or not with really Moses, but when we get to the sanctuary message, all the way through that time after they killed Jesus Christ. And if you would have thought that they would have considered all the history that they actually know and to understand that they were guilty of something, but then the Bible said they stopped their ears because they didn't want to hear what the, the sins that they had committed in a sense. And ultimately, because they disregarded the, the warning, then at the end of that 70 weeks, when they, when they kill uh, Stephen, the same way that, that nation was no longer God's primary way of bringing the gospel to the, to the, to the world. And then, which actually makes sense when, I, when you think of it, if we actually, if we are called by God to do a, or to bring a message to the people, and warnings after warnings that God is giving us to, to, for us to get to hate, uh, to hate sin and turn back to him, and we decide to slight uh, the warning, then we shouldn't be surprised if God actually passes us by and choose other people. And as we were talking about the, the, the first Andrew's message, which is fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come, and we know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But there is something we actually, uh, we don't connect the fear God with. Because in Proverbs chapter 8, and in verse number, I believe, 15. No, not 15. Verse 11. Um, wait. No, oh, yeah, from verse 11, he says, For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things one may desire cannot be compared with her. I, this is now God speaking, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and anger, Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. And we usually think of the fear of the Lord as being of wisdom, but we actually forget that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And so by getting wisdom uh, from God, then God will empower you to hate evil. And I think this is something for us to learn uh, when God is giving us wisdom, it's not just to show off, but it's for us to make better decisions in regards to evil and to get away from evil. And that's my, my last thought from that part. No, that's true, Mario. Thanks for sharing. I think it's important that we, um, you know, that we study our Bibles, like, you know, uh, as, as best as we can, you know, and to, to pray for, you know, for guidance. And because it's important, you know, that we, that we, you know, distinguish, you know, that good, good from evil. And I think it, it closely ties in with uh, uh, on the last page of the book, it says um, the, the Second Thessalonians 2, verse 9 through 11. I'll go ahead and read. Go ahead and read those. It says... <coughs> The coming of the lawless one, uh, sorry, the coming of the lawless one is according uh, to the working of Satan, uh, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness, all unrighteous uh, deception among those uh, who perish, because uh, they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Mm -hmm. And for this reason, God will send uh, them a strong delusion that they should 
uh, believe the line. So, you know, Satan is working, you know, and, and at, the, at the moment right now, like God has given us a warning, you know, and, and that warning is, uh, is given to us, you know, to, to come out of Babylon, you know, to truly come out of Babylon. And before, uh, there's a, there's a quote earlier, uh, where it says, um, Thomas Goethe, he says, did they uh, come clean out of Babylon? And I think that's really important because it applies to everybody. Did we truly come out of Babylon? Did we, uh, did we truly like completely come out of Babylon or is there still that sin that's holding us back? Is there something that's, you know, hindering us from, from truly, uh, accepting God and, you know, letting him work in our lives and, you know, transforming us, transforming our lives. And so, so and there's going to, and, and, and in the, and the, these last days, there's going to be a lot that are going to be you know, dissatisfied, you know, with, um, with their present condition, as it says, uh, not a few are uh, dissatisfied with their present condition and are longing for a clearer light. And who else is going to give that clear light but us, you know? And I think as, you know, uh, us, know as, us having this, this truth, you know, we're light bearers and we're responsible for the light that we have. Um, I don't know if you guys have anything else to say about that. Does have any comments? Yeah, you, you hear me, Jamie? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, I, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, talking about okay. this, uh, this uh, coming out of Babylon, uh, the uh, that's the last message that God gives to the world, you know? It's um, yeah, basically the last message he gives to the churches, you know, to come out of these uh, institutions that have corrupted themselves. Um, and... And it's a it's a it's a it's a call that God makes that's very personal, but it's also collective, you know. Um, and we must heed the the message because um, basically we always see it as something um, as something collective that it refers to other people and other churches, but it also refers to us at, at the oh, end. Shit. I don't know why when I shared that, but I wanted you guys to see this very quick. Um, if it gets cut, I see that when I share, it's sort of like. It's it's kind of iffy, um, but I don't know if you guys see that right there. Yeah, we can that see slide. it. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so it says Babylon filled with every unclean and hateful bird. This is what I found. It says uh, patriarchs and prophets talking about the sin at the side of or the apostasy at the side of Jordan. It says those who will dishonor God's image and defile His temple in their own persons will not scruple uh, at any dishonor to God that will gratify the desire of their depraved hearts. Sensual indulgence weakens the mind and debases the soul. The moral and intellectual powers are benumbed and paralyzed by the gratification of the animal propensities. And it is impossible for the slave of passion to realize the sacred obligation of the law of God, to appreciate the atonement or to place a right value upon the soul. Now listen to this. The soul becomes a blackened and desolate waste, the habitation of the evil spirits and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Beings formed in the image of God are dragged down to a level with the brutes. What, it's, what astonished me about this is that she quotes Revelation 18, the description of the fallen churches. Mm -hmm. So many times we see this as supplying to these Protestant churches but may, very well, it can be applying to me right now. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It could be applying to me. Why? Because I'm in indulging in the passions of this world. I'm watching pornography, um, you know, indulging in, in, in satisfactions that are, you know, not appropriate for a Christian. I'm debasing my soul. And I can't appreciate the truth for this time. And I become filled with every cage of unclean and hateful bird. So God is calling us individually too to heed his warning. Just as Satan attacked God's people right before conquering Canaan into indulgence, and it all started with what thoughts, just like Jacob said in the beginning. It all happened with just small thoughts. It all started with just, you know, these, these coming into the camp and taking out, and it started with the leaders too. So we're seeing, you know, several um, common denominators it started with the leaders in the Jewish nation. It started with the leaders in the time of 1844. And it's hitting the leaders more than every, any time in our days too. He is calling and he is attracting and he's attacking God's people by indulgence. Right before we get into the heavenly Canaan. 
and um, we must be in guard, you know, because because of this sin, a plague hit the nation, you know, and many died, many people died, and the leaders were, were hanged uh, in front of the sun. So God is calling us, not only, he's not only calling the people of other denominations, of other Protestant, you know, faiths, to come out of their institutions, but he's calling us to come out of this world. You know, Ephesians 5, 11, 14, this is the last uh, uh, PowerPoint I had for the for this topic, and says they have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And it continues saying, but all these things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, by the word of God, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. And finally, God is calling us, and as it says in Isaiah 60, verse 1 and 2, it says, Arise, shine, for the light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, that darkness shall cover the earth, and darkness is covering the earth right now, and, in gr and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. So this is God's message to us, I believe. As, you know, young people, as, you know, Christian people, we have known these truths for so many years. Let it not happen as it happened to the Jewish nation. Let it not happen to us what happened to the people, to the Protestant churches in 1844. They, many heeded the, the warning by fear and, you know, left their sins for a time. But once the disappointment came, many fell away, you know. God, I believe through all these things that are happening in this world, God is trying our faith. He is trying every particle, every fiber of our character to see if we are right with God, if we are sincere, if we are pure, if we love holiness and we want to be with him, if we really yearn for his second coming and we believe that he's coming. Um, before it interrupts again, I think this is the last message I took from this uh from this chapter and I, I believe this is what God is calling us to arise and to shine in time like this you know I, I believe we didn't come to live in this time in this age and time of the world just for no reason I think God has called us for a purpose and that purpose is to manifest his glory to this world right I don't know what you guys think about this thought I think it's a great thought And I think it is our duty uh, to <laughs> to to heed the warnings and and do our part. And also, I think uh, you know how we're saying, like you know how we're talking about Babylon. You know, it's important for us not to be confused. And by what I mean by that is uh, uh, to not have ties in, in both places. You know, hmm. that's right. You know, in the world and 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 with God. So I think it's it's important. You know, because if you know, if we have you know, you no, know, if we share things with both things, you know, with uh, both parties, you know, people are gonna see that, and you know, it's gonna be a terrible example for them. So I think it's important that we you know we have ourselves fixed before we we share that with others as well. That's true. That's true. So um, we're, next week we're gonna have uh, chapter twenty two. Twenty two. 22. Um, uh, so who's, who, you're going to do that, Damien, or who's going to do that? Mario, I thought you uh, said you were doing it. I was in 23. I probably was going to do 23. That's what he said. Yeah, that was 23. Mario's doing 23. I guess, I mean, I could do 22 unless anybody else wants to <laughs> help, help uh, us out. <laughs> well, I can do 22 and 23. <laughs> I mean, like, like besides Josh and Mario, <laughs> I don't mind. I don't mind. Honestly, this this book is very kind of blessing. It's, we're, we're all looking at at, at Peter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Peter! Where's Where's Danny? Your mic. Or Jacob. Your microphone is very good, Peter. <laughs> or, or Jacob. Oh, it, it, it sounded good from our side. So, I tried to get one for Mario, but it didn't work in the beginning. So. No, uh, it was working. I just had, I just had uh, both my phone and laptop on, so I had to turn one off. 
All right, so next chapter is prophecies fulfilled. Um, so uh, I guess Damien, and then we're gonna help you, Damien. Yeah. We're gonna help you out. We help you, Damien. Yeah. So, <laughs> so <laughs> we'll do that next. Yes. So uh, Peter, can you end with the prayer? Sure. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us this time to go through um, the great controversy. And thank you so much for giving us light to things that we read and and things that um, we didn't know as well. Lord, help us to not only uh, re, like uh, not only retain this this information, but also to apply it and share it to others who who need it. Lord, we know that the time is is um, the time is running short. Um, so, and we're waiting for your coming, Lord. Um, help us to to live a life that uh, life that you want us to live. Um, I pray all this. I pray for everyone represented here and anyone who wasn't able to make it uh, today. And please bless everyone here and their families. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Peter, you want me to take you the microphone, or are you coming over here? I'll, I'll go over too. there, and then I'll, I'll head to Damien's because uh, okay. I have a microphone for Mario. But I'll I'll be right oh. there. Okay, all right, I'll wait for you here. All right, see you guys. All right, see guys. You. See you guys. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I hope uh, I hope that you guys could hear it from the phone and if not then hopefully I can make it better next time until then bye bye